Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Christopher Polk, uh, your chair for tonight. Uh, Professor Finance uh, in the, at the LSE here, and also the director of the Financial Markets Group, a research center at the LSE. Uh, for 26 years, the Financial Markets Group, our FMG, has been a leader in cutting edge uh, research in financial economics, as well as at the forefront of academic uh, practitioner and policymaker interaction. I'm very, very pleased uh, tonight to welcome you to the inaugural public event of the Systemic Risk Center, a new five million pound ESRC funded uh, research center here at the LSC, uh, co-directed by Drs. John Danielson and Dr. J.P. Zigrand, who have been instrumental in making this very important uh, research center a reality. Uh, the aim of the Systemic Risk Center, or the SRC, is to study the fundamental risks facing our financial system. And to do so, the center has uh, brought together a group of researchers, not only in finance and economics, but also in computer science, uh, in political science and in law, and even the natural and mathematical sciences to study these issues. And these researchers together uh, will study the way in which uh, the economic, financial, legal and political systems can actually create risks through such things as feedback loops or the unintended consequences of financial regulation and other mechanisms. Uh, after the experience of the last five years, I think we can all agree that uh, just pursuing those research questions are critical. And uh, it's our hope that uh, this research center will not only produce the fundamental research that will be in next generation's textbooks, but also the policy impact that will affect, uh, the, in a positive way, the economic outcomes of this generation. Um, and so as a consequence, uh, the SRC is going to be the place to go for pol policy relevant and policy informed research on systemic risks. So tonight, the Systemic Risk Center is going to host a panel discussion on one of those aforementioned topics, the unintended consequences of the new financial regulations. Our panel tonight consists of three experts. First, we have uh, Professor Charles Goodhart, an emeritus professor uh, at the FMG here at the LSE, who is known worldwide as an expert on banking, monetary policy, and financial regulation. As testament to that expertise, uh, Charles uh, served as an independent member of the important and influential Monetary Policy Committee, Committee at the Bank of England from 1997 to 2000. Indeed, his latest book, is the regulatory response to the financial crisis. So you can see he's a very important member of this panel. We're also very pleased to welcome Mr. Matt King uh, to the LSE. Matt is Managing Director and Global Head of Credit Product Strategy at Citi, where he and his team form views and advise clients on a wide range of products in credit and fixed income markets. And as a consequence, Matt interacts with both issuers and regulatory bodies uh, uh, constantly. Um, Matt's editorial pieces on markets and risk uh, have a passionate following on websites because of their provocative, insightful nature. And then finally, we have one of the co-directors of the new Systemic Risk Center, Dr. John Danielson, who is a reader in the finance department here at the LSE. Uh, as you might guess, uh, his research coincides uh, quite closely with the, those uh, research agendas in the Systemic Risk Center. They include financial stability, systemic risk, extreme market movements, uh, market liquidity and financial crisis. Uh, John is the author of a textbook, Financial Risk Forecasting, and is one of the experts in the department in that regard. So the agenda for tonight is as follows. I'll briefly introduce the issue at hand. Then each speaker, beginning with Professor Goodhart, continuing on to Mr. King, and then ending up with Dr. Danielson, will have roughly 10 minutes uh, to develop a theme on the issue. Uh, following that, there'll be an interchange among the panel members followed by an interchange between you, the audience, and the panel. Uh, during that portion of the evening, what I'll do is I'll collect questions, uh, comments, uh, short questions, concise comments in groups of three, and then ask the panel to respond. And then, hopefully, if we have enough time, the members of the panel can offer some closing remarks. So let me first remind you that tonight's event is being recorded and that the Twitter hashtag for the event is LSE Systemic. So we're here tonight to stake to take stock of the reform and regulation of our global financial system 
after its near cataclysmic collapse in September 2008. In particular, we want to discuss whether the post-crisis reforms uh, of financial regulations will be effective in protecting us from financial excesses or may instead perversely destabilize the financial system. Now, we almost agree that the previous regulatory framework failed us and that responding to the lessons learned is crucial. Of course, no acceptable set of regulations can prevent market participants from making mistakes that can create economic instability. However, we, we must certainly try to change the regulatory environment in ways that will make the system more stable in the face of those mistakes that will surely come. Before we begin, I want to stress the importance of a functional perspective. What we should take as given are the functional needs of the end users of these institutions that we're going to regulate. Uh, the entrepreneur borrowing to pursue a project, uh, the family buying a house, the firm issuing securities to finance expansion. Not a particular form of institution or regulatory framework. Both of those should evolve to best provide the essential functions necessary in a particular market. The reason a functional perspective is particularly useful in this context is because a new institutional framework will almost certainly increase the cost of financial intermediation. Now surely, the institutional framework we had before the financial crisis was imperfect. And surely, the new financial regulation should impose on banks the cost of failure that they have been imposing on society in order to minimize the moral hazard element. At the same time, excessive, onerous, or simply misguided regulation can result in a risky financial system where institutions are unwilling or even unable to meet those important functional needs of society to create a more regulated, less unstable, but still effective and innovative financial system is a tremendous challenge. So tonight, we ask our panel of experts whether that challenge has been met. Professor Goodhart, please. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, I'd just like to start by a rather more general comment, which is that idiosyncratic risk as a generality is decreasing as we achieve a greater control over our environment and with it medical advances and so on. But it's likely that systemic risk is increasing at the same time as idiosyncratic risk is decreasing. Now, that's uh, partly because uh, the sort of desire of, sort of micro-prudential uh, and trying to look at the individual uh, has the effect of tending to make everyone much the same. And the self-similarity of our populations, of our behavior, of our diets, and all the rest of it, uh, are becoming greater. Uh, so that under normal circumstances, uh, everyone does better. And the expectation of life is generally increasing. But at the same time, as we have greater self-similarity, an institution subject to microprudential regulation are all encouraged to behave along the lines that are thought best so that everybody looks much the same. Um, the interconnectedness uh, of our societies, um, of our financial systems, are increasing. And that means that if anything comes along which endangers any part, it is much more likely to endanger the whole than it was when we were all far less interconnected. Uh, and I sometimes think as I develop uh, a flu germ and sit in my airplane um, that I'm likely to be infecting people with the same flu germ who are likely to go to about five or, or right round the world. Um, so that the interconnections that we have, uh, communications, transport, travel, uh, indeed, virtually all our interconnections are greater, and that means with the increasing of self-similarity and at the same time an increasing of, of interconnections, systemic risk in all its manifestations is likely to be increasing. And exactly the same, of course, uh, is true in finance, so that the need for a systemic risk center is greater than, than it was in the past. But we've been asked to talk about unintended consequences of regulation, and inevitably there are many, uh, because we can't foresee how people will react, and we can't foresee 
everything that is likely to occur. Um, I'm going to start with a couple. As a result of the um, financial crisis, uh, there was a call on the taxpayer uh, to put up a lot of funding, and the national debt went up, um, and economic life became more difficult. Uh, the response to that has been to suggest that we should shift the burden of these losses um, from the taxpayer to the banks. And wouldn't that be a good idea? Well, the first point that I would make, ask you to remember is that you can't put a burden on an abstract entity like a bank. Effectively, the burden is borne by some human connected with a bank, whether it is a bank creditor, a bank shareholder, uh, or a bank employee. So we are not talking about shifting a burden from a human being to an abstract entity which doesn't feel anything. We are simply talking about shifting the burden from one group of humans to another group of humans. Now, one of the features of burden sharing is it is easier to put taxes and burdens uh, on people who can't avoid them. And it's very difficult to escape being a taxpayer as long as you're prepared to, or feel that you want to go on living in that particular country. On the other hand, it is extremely easy to avoid being an uninsured depositor if you think that there is the slightest chance that somebody is going to require you to bear the cut, haircut or the burden of having to pay for um, the losses of a bank. We are at the moment facing a situation in Cyprus uh, where there is a great concern about bailing out the Cypriot banks out of a belief that they are holding a very large amount of deposits uh, from various uh, Russians, uh, which deposits are not necessarily entirely clean-handed. Well, I can tell you that this is already leading to a very, very sharp shift of deposits out of the Cypriot banks, uh, leading to a worsening of the problem. And I can also tell you that if you wish to go ahead with this and provide or uh, impose a haircut on, on depositors, uninsured depositors, it will mean that the contagion effect of any fa potentially failing bank will become far worse. Well, perhaps we can deal with that by um, giving depositor preference and only putting the burden on the, um, the bondholders. Well, if the depositors are all going to be saved, given how little equity there is at the moment in most of the banks, and you're a bondholder, that effectively means that the amount you're going to get after the bank has been recapitalized by effectively cutting what the bank owes to you is likely to be virtually nil or very close to it. If you think you're going to be subject to such a very large loss, so you've got a massive downside exposure and no upside exposure, you're not actually going to buy that kind of bank bond. So that the attempt to shift from the taxpayer to the bank creditor through bail-inable bonds is likely to mean that either the bail bonds are going to have to be required by regulation at a very, very high rate of interest, or they're not going to be, no one's going to buy them. So that the attempt to shift the burden of bank losses away from the taxpayer to a group who are much easier, capable, much more capable of getting away, of running, of avoiding the burden, is going to mean that the whole basis of uh, bank finance, the portfolio basis, the business model of banks, is going to change and not necessarily in a better direction. Because it's, we find it very difficult to think uh, you know, more than a step or two ahead. And the, 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 the likely future arrangement of finance and banking, if you try and shift the burden from those who can't run to those who can run, uh, is likely to be very considerable. Now, my second area where I'd like to talk about unintended consequences 
is how about the proposal in the Independent Commission on Banking, Vickers Commission, to separate the desirable retail banking bit, which we all need, Captain Mannering of the bank manager or wherever it is, away from the, um, the casino, the investment bank. I would wait if I were to tell you that this is actually likely to make both parts riskier and likely to actually to cause the financial system of the UK to be riskier rather than less risky. How could the retail bank be made less risky? or more risky if this division? Well, what retail banks do now, primarily when they lend to the private sector, is that they lend pri- primarily to, to other households who are borrowing on mortgages, or they lend to construction companies, or they lend to property companies. It's a myth which we all grew up with, that uh, banks took in deposits from households and then lent them on to manufacturing companies. They don't. They take deposits from households and lend primarily uh, on property, property property-related lending, uh, to to commercial real estate construction companies and households who want to borrow. So that the, the financing of the retail bank leads to is likely to lead with this separation to an even greater concentration uh, on the asset side, on lending to property-related assets. Now, I've lived through four financial crises in the UK in my time. Uh, one of them you probably did, well, some of you won't remember any of them, but uh, one, the one that wasn't related to property was the 1981-82, which was related to lending uh, to emerging markets, particularly in Latin America, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. The other three, 1973-75, the fringe bank crisis, 91-92, and the latest crisis were all related uh, to the boom-bust in property, both residential and commercial. What is going to happen is that the retail banks will be much more focused, like uh, Northern Rock, like Anglo-Irish, like most of the Irish banks, even more focused in future on property than they were in the past. And since it's the property boom bust that causes them the, the basic problem, so it's going to mean that the retail banks, which will no longer have the advantage of diversification through what the investment banks have been doing, will be even riskier than they were in the past. I have a delightful legal friend uh, who actually claims that one of the features of the division between retail and investment will be to protect the relatively safe investment bank from the risky retail bank. I might add that Lehman Brothers, which was indeed a pure investment bank, not a retail bank, fell not because of taking propriety bets in, uh, in, in, in various derivative markets. In fact, its derivative books were highly profitable. Lehman fell because it took the same kind of bet on the housing market, on mortgage-backed securities, as the others did. The investment banks will also be worse off, um, not because their asset side will be riskier. If anything, their asset side might be safer if they can no longer invest in property, uh, commercial and residential, but because they will now be stripped uh, of their relatively stable uh, deposit base. So they will have to finance themselves either at a much higher cost through the long-term market, which, which, which is limited, or through much riskier wholesale short-term deposits. So the investment bank will be made riskier because its liability side will be in worse, in worse shape. And the retail bank will be made riskier because it won't have diversity on its asset side. So both will actually be... Uh, um, Get into severe, potentially get into severe trouble. So we've got a um, a, a recent so-called reform, whose effect, to iterate in my judgment, is not likely to reduce risk, but actually to enhance risk uh, within the system. So um, uh, the 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 effects of many of these recent reforms are not likely to be in the longer run exactly what their proponents would have hoped. Matt, please. So I guess 
for me, the, the most obvious personal unintended consequences of the new financial regulations is that I end up on this stage. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to be introduced as an expert. My job is credit strategy. I'm supposed to analyze what companies are doing and where their bonds trade in the market. And the only reason I can even pretend to know anything about this is because when we try and forecast where credit markets are going, these days it has as much to do with where we think financial regulations are going to be as it has with anything else. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in, in three sections, first about what I call the optimization problem, then about the trade-off between growth and liquidity, and then lastly about how, as I see it, the, the way we're kind of doomed to short-termist approaches uh, almost in, inevitably kind of subverts whatever the aims are of uh, the new regulations. But I guess if there's, if there's one argument that I hope to convince you of in the next 10 minutes, it's the way in which, in many respects, despite making progress on, on some counts, the way in which, in many respects, how we, our efforts to suppress near-term and, if you like, sort of at-the-money volatility add to the longer-term uh, risks and the more out-of-the-money uh, type of tail risks. So, I mean, on that optimization problem uh, to begin with, I think it's, it's important to realize that, that we bankers are basically failed engineers. And... Uh, it's many, many people with, with backgrounds in structuring, it's, it's like, certainly for me, it's like, okay, you, you, you think you're interested in engineering, and then it's, it's too much like hard work, and you can get all of the intellectual <laughs> pleasure and hopefully better financial rewards, at least in this country, uh, as things stood, uh, by looking at financial services instead. And what this means is that partly through the pressure of markets and partly through our own nature, we are uh, slaves, we are driven to optimize everything. And... Uh, give us a capital ratio to optimize to, and we will go and do so with probably disastrous consequences. And of course, this is exactly what happened with the European banks all measured on their risk-weighted assets. So they went and bought uh, stuff with low risk weightings, but lots and lots and lots of it because they weren't controlled on leverage. And conversely, US banks always used to be measured on leverage ratios and with much less emphasis on risk-weighted assets. So they in turn went and bought small amounts, but of very risky stuff. Now, of course, if you like, the regulators kind of got the right idea. Let's make it more complicated. Let's give people multiple ratios to optimize to, and that way it will take us longer to go and do something stupid. Um, but even here, there's a sort of nasty side effect that, that the complexity that you get as a result makes it to harder to spot those sources of stupidity. And I think what we're already seeing is that in many respects, the, the market's are already becoming distorted as people try and comply with a multitude of different ratios, whether it's on capital, whether it's on liquidity, uh, and with the need to mark to market, the need to post collateral, the need to margin derivatives transactions, and yet this is having slightly awkward side effects uh, in terms of the shortage of safe assets to present as collateral. And above all, in terms of the increased pro-cyclicality uh, that you get, as everyone, again, focuses on mark-to-market, and then suddenly what happens when things have sold off somewhat? Oh, I need to post more collateral, and yet that probably means I need to liquidate some assets somewhere else. And, and this pro-cyclicality, which has always been there to some extent as a feature of a market, has in many respects probably increased, even as we have tried to uh, reduce the... Um, uh, reduce the near-term risks by looking more closely at, at, at asset values. And again, this sort of picks up on something that, that Charles was saying. In the market, we've always, been, we've always been quite good at building bubbles even by ourselves. And over a series of different crises now, every time the next bubble always seems to occur in the asset class that did best in the previous bust and therefore look safe on everybody's models. And so you go back and... Uh, after Japan blew up in 1990, it was uh, equities elsewhere and the tech sector which looked good. And then when that blew up in 2000, it was the real estate sector that was really quite resilient in 2001, 2002. And then in 2008, when real estate blew up and mortgage-backed securities blew up, of course, it generally has been government bonds which have been the safe asset and have outperformed. And only a couple of years ago, I remember... Uh, chatting to one German client of ours, and we were discussing how actually we th thought securitized credit by 2010 was a really good thing to go out and buy. And they said, oh, no, 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 we could never go and buy that. The board wouldn't stand for it. Uh, much too risky. And I said, well, what are you doing instead? And they said, oh, we're putting our money in Greek government bonds. <laughs> and and, and the, the trouble is these things look efficient, and the regulators almost end up defining these things as, as efficient, uh, so even as we're trying to control the risk on the one hand, you risk adding to that pro-cyclicality on the other. And this takes me to my second point, which is 
I worry deeply that we have not acknowledged nearly explicitly enough the trade-off between stability on the one hand and growth on the other. We may well want to pursue greater stability, fine, but that may come at the expense of growth and we need to be more open about it. And to my mind, there are, there are two problems here. The first is that because we have not been open enough about this, there is the risk of political disappointment. When we look at the Italian election results, when we look at the uh, what's happening in Greece in terms of the steady move towards more extremist parties. Uh, there was an even article about the rise of an anti-Euro party in Germany uh, just mm -hmm. recently. The, uh, what the public is finding is because they have not been prepared for the idea that what we thought was normal growth over the last 30 years was in fact abnormal and credit driven, so they are then ending up very disappointed with the pace of growth that we are getting. And even with greater stability, there is the risk that uh, or apparent stability, there is the risk that people end up voting for different solutions or embarking on more experimental monetary policies, for example, to try and pursue uh, the, the, the stronger rates of growth uh, that, that we had beforehand. And this, this generally, for me, th this, this is going on across the board as we, on the one hand, raise bank capital requirements, probably quite sensibly, but then get surprised when we see amounts of new lending going down and see that all of the banks are very happy to lend money, it's just that they don't want to take any risk on it. And what do they end up going and doing instead? It's things like buying lots and lots of government bonds, which the regulators virtually everywhere define as being, being risk-free. Uh, you sort of see the same debate going on in, in China at the moment, where the pace of growth uh, has slowed significantly and the uh, policymakers have been faced with an awkward decision. Do we uh, try and impose new regulations to constrain credit growth or do we push up overall pace of growth in the economy but by reigniting a real estate bubble? And likewise, in, the, in other places where we have tried to ensure stability through new regulations, again, to my mind, to some extent, that's actually probably a bad idea and you could almost do with more instability. Um, I mean, to take, to take an easy example of that, say the Volcker rule in the US, and we need to stop this nasty prop trading that banks uh, have been doing, and, and yet what, certainly what we see internally is that the greater constraints on the ability of desks to make markets, in markets like mine in credit, mean that markets are simply more illiquid. And you can get some very frightening statistics if you compare the growth of the credit market and above all the growth of mutual funds to the size of the uh, balance sheet that the street can dedicate to making markets in credit. You get these scary numbers that back in 2007 it would have taken a 50% outflow from the uh, mutual funds in order to double the street's holdings of credit. Now if there's just a 5% outflow from the mutual funds, it would force the street to double their holdings of credit, and there's no way that they want to do that. And so again, we've sort of reduced the degree of volatility today, because you can't get a bid on your security, and a number of asset managers have told me that literally they can't do the same trades they used to. They need to divide things up into smaller trades and or they don't ask for the bid on many securities in the first place, but at the risk of greater illiquidity and instability tomorrow when they really do need that bid. And even for all the criticism, say, that JP Morgan as uh, chief investment office has had, for example, for the uh, large losses, again, I worry that by by removing things like prop desks or restricting the ability that people have to relatively freely hedge, what you end up with is a market where everybody is the same way around. And again, that might look stable when everything is going up, but risks being very unstable indeed when things reverse. And we've sort of thought the third example of the same thing is the ban on naked shorts uh, in CDS for, so for sovereign CDS uh, in the Eurozone. And we had warned at the time that this would greatly reduce liquidity in CDS markets, which it has done. We warned at the time that this would put much more pressure on government bond deals as people who couldn't hedge their CDS choose to sell, sell government bonds in the, in, uh, instead. And today you haven't seen that aside of it, but mostly because all of the peripheral sovereigns have rallied. And as we anticipate they sell off at some future point, you will almost certainly get more volatility there because while at the, on, the, on the one hand we've tried to create greater stability, we've tried to ban some of those naked shorts, again, on the face of it, it succeeds, but at the risk of greater instability tomorrow. The last point that I want to make has to do with the ways across the board in which by going for short-term solutions or taking the decisions which are easy in the short term, again, uh, for me, we've increased risk in the longer term and or ended up distorting the markets. For me, 
we see these distortions across the board. We mostly blame them at this point on monetary policy. And indeed, uh, you've almost heard it explicitly from Bernanke saying that they would rather have a new bubble in the, in the high yield market, even if, if there is any chance whatsoever this contributes to a revival in the economy. And, and yet, as I, whether I look at the Eurozone, whether I look at, say, the reluctance to actually make use of bail-in, and I probably have a slightly different view from Charles on this, um, again, even if people are doing this for well-intentioned reasons, they're, inter- they're concerned about contagion and they're concerned about the threat to financial stability, what you end up getting is uh, a zombie banking system and zombie corporates, whereby banks uh, do not... Um, uh, do not make loans to, say, new startup companies uh, which might have the ability to grow and expand and employ people because they've used all their capital lending to the large corporate because they didn't have the capital to take the loss and all the government tapped them on the shoulder and told them to roll their loan. And th- this, it's, it's ironic, I think, that it's in the UK that there is the strongest debate about zombie banks and zombie lending, much more so than in the Eurozone, when there... Uh, the problem is almost certainly significantly greater. And likewise, it's in the UK that everyone is suddenly worried about retail bankruptcies of Jessops and Comet and and so on. And again, you may not be getting them elsewhere. You may have the appearance of stability on the face of things, but it's not that the situation on the ground is actually any better. And indeed, you're almost certainly uh, condemning yourself to much slower rates of growth longer term as a result. So to sum up, again, for me, while many of the policies have been well-intentioned and while certain things like forcing banks to hold more capital and giving them more ratios uh, um, to, to optimize to, I think are almost certainly good things. Again, for me, there's, there's not been nearly enough honesty about uh, the, uh, the role that credit created, um, that played in, in, in creating unsustainable rates of growth previously. And as a result, everything we see, certainly my whole view on the market, falls back into this sort of short-termist trap. I used to have a presentation back in 2009 where I said, uh, buy the bubble, sell the bath. I used to say, look, it's no good my being right about the sovereign debt crisis of 2012 if I lose my job in the rally of 2009-2010. And it's sort of the same thing today. It's no good being right about the sovereign insolvencies of 2016 and the bank bail-ins of 2016 if I lose my job in the rally of 2013. We are all slaves to the short term, and by not having the guts to impose losses on bondholders in many cases, to my mind, we make things look stable today at the risk of a bigger crisis tomorrow. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, John? Now, in this debate, there is one thing that everybody agrees to. I think the only thing everybody agrees to is the fact that regulations failed prior to 2007. Now, of course, since then, the political leadership has been leaning on everybody to do something about finance telling the very same institutions that failed before the crisis to shape up and actually do it properly this time. Now, of course, this is where the problem starts. Nobody really knows what the rules should be or what went wrong before 2007. Now, it's not the lack of analysis or recommendations, but the central banks and the supervisors and the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Report were all told to create new rules, and new rules they have been creating rapidly since then. Now, any policy for safeguarding the financial system falls under what we macroprudential geeks called uh, macroprudential regulations. That is defined broadly as a set of rules that uh, try to do two things simultaneously, making sure, sure the financial system does its job properly and remaining safe at the same time, safe and robust. <coughs> well, the problem is, while we do know on a fundamental level that something went wrong, we don't really know why it happened and we don't really know, even knowing less, what we should have done better. Now, if you think about financial crisis on a fundamental level, they all look the same. If we look at crisis past, we see this clearly. One crisis I studied in some detail is the well-known financial crisis of 1763. Had all the same common ingredients. Too much credit invested badly. Bank was assuming market and funding liquidity was infini- infinite and forever and that they could always hedge their positions, that the world will always continue as it did before. It always ends in tears. And in fact, so recurring crises over the past hundreds of years have led the banking nations to create banking regulations. And of course, these rules never have worked really well. Well, the reason is 
we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want banks to be safe, but they wanted to take risk, even only to give us some mortgage or cousin Willie an SME loan. Since these objectives are incompatible beyond at least a certain threshold, crises are inevitable and cannot be, or nor should be, prevented unless you actually eliminate risk-taking completely. Now, Vickers might say that crises can be reduced in destructiveness and probability. If you want to prevent them altogether, is a different story, but it's quite easy. Several countries have managed it quite successfully. I point you to North Korea and Cuba. But I digress. Now, this time around, this time around the crisis came as a shock to everybody because we hadn't really seen a proper financial crisis for a generation. We thought we were protected by existing financial regulations like Basel. Now, there were some dissenting voices at the time. Now, in 2001, several of us, Charles included and myself, wrote um, what is now probably an early Persian paper called An Academic Critique of Basel II, warning of the dangers of the regulations, and some of, some of it did come to pass. However, if you think about the post-2007 event, we have had a lot of soul-searching and trying to figure out what went wrong. And, however, almost immediately, things started to go pear-shaped. The authorities, instead of questioning why the regulations failed uh, on a fundamental level, forgot what is the first rule of holes. If you're in one, stop digging. Instead of fundamentally thinking about financial regulations, they just decided to do more or less exactly what they did before, but more intensively. Now, I can illustrate this with a couple of examples. The first international rules for safeguarding the financial system, Basel I, were implemented in 1992 and were basically successful for its intended objective. Okay. Now, Basel I was 30 pages long. The next round, Basel II, was 600 pages long, and by the time they were implemented in 2008, was intellectually 10 years out of date. On last count, and probably the number is higher than I think, the Basel III exceeded 6,000 pages. Basel III aims to minutely control risk-taking, uh, leaving no scope for misbehavior. There are rules for everything. Well, there's a basic problem with this. The more detailed the rules are, the more precise the vehicle rule is exactly the point that Matt was pointing to. Now, there's an old joke that, at least among macroprudential geeks like me, that says, there's some drunk man looking for his keys under a lamppost, and a passing policeman asks him, why are you looking there? And the drunk responds, that's where the, key, that's where the light is. Now, <laughs> the 6,000 pages of Basel III define where the light is. They are, they are, in a sense, a manual for anybody who wants risk, giving them exactly what is permitted behavior, including some very risky behavior. And furthermore, the incentives for looking for risk, uh, for hidden places to, to take risk in a complex and unlit areas is even stronger now because the profitability of safe, more safe, more visible strategies is much less because of the new rules, as Matt was pointing out. However, a bigger problem has emerged with this. By focusing on the intricate details of how banks behave, the more, more important problem of the complex interaction between banks is being ignored. Now, to me at least, what matters is how banks react to shocks. Take a simple example. Suppose some bad news hits the financial system. As each bank reacts, the trading behavior of each bank affects every other bank in the system. If they sell, quite rationally from their own point of view, prices fall and you amplify the crisis. Now, this can, of course, create a vicious feedback loop uh, even without bank rules that demand further selling. Now, this is something that we have at, at LSC have called endogenous risk. This is perhaps the founding philosophy of the new systemic risk center. Financial crisis, in our view, is caused by the interaction of market participants that can either reinforce each other and end in crisis or counteract each other, causing a shock to fizzle out. Now, trying to bring about the second outcome, in my view at least, should be the objective of the new financial regulations. We should aim for greater macroprudential uh, robustness, but what we got was instead just more, a lot more microprudential regulations. Now, the problem is worse. The authorities just noted um, at the beginning of the year that banks measure risk in different ways. 
In response, both the Basel Committee and the EBA, European Banking Authority, essentially said that they want banks to harmonize models to make them more similar. Because the problem is if you have risk-based regulation, it's problematic if risk is measured differently, if the same position has different risk uh, measured by different people. So both Basel Committee and EBA want model harmonization to some extent. But I think this is absolutely plain wrong, and I had it on my blog last week. Because it, the problem is it creates a homogeneous perception of the world, and a homogeneous perception of the world can only amplify cycles, i.e. is pro-cyclical. Now, fundamentally, the new regulations, I think, will have quite a number of unintended consequences because what is really lacking is research-led policymaking. There are too many of the rules that are created are based on politics and somebody's assertions with no underlying scientific basis. Now, some of these, to give you a partial list, include the minimum resting time in MIFID II, which may just as easily cause less liquidity when needed, the Vicus proposal may cause bank funding to migrate from stable deposits to unstable market-based funding. And besides the arguments given by Charles earlier, the Basel III liquidity ratios are poorly thought out. They, for example, they discourage banks from fulfilling what should be the basic function of maturity transformations. The new rules on bonuses have the potential for increasing instability and risk-taking. The bank on, ban on short-selling and CTS trading in Europe is explicitly to at least meet defined, uh, designed to prevent bad news from becoming public. So in the end, this is why I think the new financial regulations will have unforeseen and unfortunate consequences. Not only will they not work, but they will create the illusion that, they, that everything is safe, and that will in turn create incentives for the wrong type of behavior making everybody worse off. All right, thank you very much, John. So now we'll move to the portion of the program where the panel asks each other questions. And John, I'll let you ask the first question. Oh, I have one for Charles. He gave a very passionate defense for taxpayers to bail out banks. And of course, I'm, I bought all the arguments, but I think you left one thing out. Well, I'm going to see if you left one thing out. If you expect taxpayers to to, uh, to backstop all the losses of banks, why don't you let the taxpayers also get the upside? In other words, why not just nationalize the whole system? Well, that's what, in fact, the uh, Swedes and the Scandinavians did in 1991, and it was the most effective way of dealing with the financial crisis that we've yet had. Um, I'm very sympathetic to those who say that the uh, RBS should be nationalized, um, it was not done, I think, primarily for presentational and political reasons. Um, the best way of handling these things is to nationalize, uh, put in new management, clear it up, and then resell it to the, um, to the private sector as quickly as you reasonably can. And bail out the bondholders? Um, you have to think what the effect is going to be on other bondholders. I mean, there is no question that when the first bank gets into difficulty, bailing out the bondholders, particularly if the bondholders don't see it coming in advance, is a very good idea. It's nice. But then the question is, assuming that the bondholders take a very severe hit, as they're likely to do in that case, what is likely to happen to the bond market subsequently? Uh, will banks be able to finance themselves at reasonable rates from that kind of asset? If you've, I knew are putting the, the bond, I'm just as, as John asked me, shouldn't the taxpayer have an upside? I'm, like, what you're doing is you're increasing the downside risk for the bondholder and not changing the upside. And the inevitable result of that uh, will either be far fewer bonds sold or only sold at a much higher rate. This is a static argument because, of course, you might easily, and, and, and in a way, this is the point made by the European authorities. We are in a big crisis right now. It is absolutely essential to bail out the banks because otherwise the, all the Russians will flee, etc. So, by, but however, the problem is by doing so, you are avoiding a short-term problem at the expense of a much bigger problem. I think you're being, being penny-wise and pound foolish because by doing so, you are creating the principle of that any time a bank runs into a loss, the taxpayer will cover the losses. That will, of course, lower the funding cost of banks. Is exactly what you're saying. That's what you like. 
But the problem is to then just increase risk-taking in banks and give us a much, more, no, much no, no, less no. stable banking system I know in the long run. And, wanna... and by the way, there's a, counter, there's a counterpoint to that because you liked, or it's a further argument, because you said, of course, we like what Sweden did in 1992. But the problem is I think you, you really should be advocating nationalizing the banks forever. Be, because, 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 because the profits accrue in the good times, you want to nationalize in the bad times, but the problem is you, to be consistent, the taxpayers should, if they're going to take the losses, they should also get the profits. The profits are accruing good times, and therefore the taxpayer, I should tax, we should tax the banks very heavily, or just nationalize the whole thing. Now, I'm the, I'm, one of the reasons I think we're getting into the mess we've got into is because we intervene far too late when the losses are, very, are, are much bigger. I'm the, I, one of the things that I think ought to be done uh, is the kind of high-trigger cocos that Charlie Calamaris and Dick Herring are suggesting, that effectively you force uh, the uh, shareholders uh, to in increase the volume of, of, of equity a great deal, or you effectively penalize them at a much earlier stage, and you intervene very much earlier when the, the losses have, uh, are, are far less built up. And the, um, uh, the FSB booklet uh, on the, what's it called, the attributes of resolution or some such phrase, um, the, the problem with that is that they're still not going to intervene in banks until, they, as they say, that there is no significant hope whatsoever that the bank will recover. There's always hope that banks will recover. You know, Things can always turn up. So it means that you don't intervene until it's far too late. Early intervention, um, effectively nationalized for a short time, um, and uh, effectively sell it off. And with, like the Swedes, the Swedes made a profit out of it. We could too if we did it right. You, I think you're asking for too much, of course. I mean, I, I do buy the fact that if you, if you, if you actually do it right, it will work. But the problem is you are trying to bail out, you're even bail out the Russian mafia because the Russian mafia keeps the Cypriot economy going. And that's quite different and intelligently designed uh, cocos by Calamaris and others. But the Russian mafia and everybody else can move their deposits very, very quickly. And if you, go, and if you signal, I'm about to, 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 to make the Russian mafia sort of suffer, they won't be there. But we and made, they, will have, they will have gone. We made an example out of the Greeks. Why don't make an example out of the Cypriots? It's too late. You, 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 the problem, and you signal this in advance. And the people who can run will run, inevitably. And, and the, the idea that you're going to make life better by putting the burden on people who can run in advance of being hit it's, it's, it just doesn't make any kind of sense. In the short term, it makes a lot of sense what you're proposing, but it creates long-term instability that is a lot more costly. Not if you intervene much earlier and force much that earlier recapitalization um, or, or intervention at a much earlier point. How right. likely do you think that's going to happen in the future? I don't see why it shouldn't. And you've only got, I'm, you know, we'll try, we probably will try this bail-in lark and the uninsured, you know, hitting the uninsured depositors. And when we find that's a total disaster, we'll have to think of something else. <laughs> so maybe the next crisis, uh, you know, after the next crisis, they'll try something a bit more sensible. But this, but this sort of takes us to the question, I mean, I'm completely with you that once you do bail-in, yes, there's a risk of needing to do lots of bail-ins because there will be a trigger effect on all the other banks and financial institutions that own those bonds. The, 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 and, and yes, if you're inflicting losses on depositors, there's a risk of deposit flight. But the, the counter-argument is that once you've converted all of these bonds and maybe even deposits into equity, that institution will look really well capitalized. And, and indeed, you almost come to the question of, of again, is shooting a few every so often good as a lesson to the others, as it were, in, in terms of making bondholders realize that they can't count on being bailed out? And... Uh, and again, yes, you almost want to, it, it comes back to one of the, one of the arguments about financial stability comes from Andy Haldane at the Bank of England is, is about, so the, these are examples of complex systems, things like forest fires, and there are, there are various laws about this, one of them being that it's very difficult to tell exactly when they start. But another of them is that the, the magnitude of the fire 
um, the longer you go without one, the greater the likelihood of a large one. And so again, it, there's an argument, do you almost, I mean, I guess it, it comes I, to the point I, of I, I think that analogy is, is misplaced. And we went without any banking crises at all from about 1938 until 1970s. And the crises in the 1970s weren't as big as the recent crisis, and the number of banking crises that we've had since the 1970s have been increasingly common. We've had lots of banking crises. As I said, I've lived through four financial crises in the UK in my own adult life. Can't say there haven't been any. Although for a lot of, for a lot of that period, that was because of the credit regulation rather than banking regulation per se. Again, it's, it's maybe we go back to, to tighter constraints on credit. But. Well, I yeah, but that uh, tended, that meant that, uh, that well, the tighter constraints on credit didn't sort of help the dynamic growth of the system. I mean, no, I knew talked about zombie, the zombie banks and zombie loans. And in the, in the days of tight credit, what you did was you lent to the big, big borrowers, the big corporations. And if you were, you know, people worry about lending to SMEs. And an SME in the 1950s and the 1960s wouldn't have got inside Captain Mannering's door. The chances of getting a loan I mean, were, were minis minuscule, particularly if you had anything to do with consumption or importing or services. You know, there were no no's. More questions from the panel? To the panel? Um, foreclosures and zombies. Um, I'm never entirely sure. I'm the 1981-1982 uh, LDC crisis was, in my view, the most serious financial crisis we had uh, in the post-war period until 2007 and 8. And that, the LDC crisis, was actually cured um, by the central bankers encouraging the commercial banks to do evergreening. Effectively, what was done uh, was that Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil couldn't repay, and they needed more money or they would go under. And so what the central bankers did was they twisted the arms of the commercial bankers to go on lending money to those countries, who then took exactly the same money and used it to repay the interest that they owed the commercial bankers. And this went on until eventually uh, the system healed and it recovered. And we managed to avert a very severe crisis through what appeared at that time to be sensible forbearance. Now take what's happened in this country. Although we've had one of the sharpest declines in housing prices in our history, there have been remarkably few foreclosures. And that's actually been because the banks, I think, in my, in my view, very sensibly, have, have tried to avoid foreclosing by being prepared to make those people who couldn't meet uh, the interest and capital repayments pay what they could and add the rest to um, the effectively outstanding uh, mortgage that they would have to repay at some stage. Now, this is with the re very low compared to 91, 92 sort of amount of foreclosures. This has meant that housing prices have been much less reduced. Um, that, that has meant that the decline in wealth has been far less. Uh, and I think that it has kept the UK economy uh, in a condition which has been far less uh, disturbing economically, socially, and in my view morally, um, than it might otherwise have been. Now, Matt, you were arguing against forbearance. Uh, do you think that the British banks should have been much tougher in kicking people out of their homes when they couldn't meet uh, uh, the amount that they had to pay and uh, <laughs> foreclosing and selling all the houses on the market for what they could get? And would that have been what you would want them to do? I think the I think there are two appro there, there are two approaches, and, I, and I'm with you that forbearance and zombies may not be quite as terrible as people say. But then again, you need to be much more honest about the about the, the growth stability uh, trade-off. So, likewise, I would I'm kind of with you on the 
uh, early 1980s, but then that's a very different approach from the whole Swedish model. And so as, as I see it, it's, it's either you go for aggressive, re- aggressive write-down, recapitalization, and we, move the, and we move on, probably if the problem is small enough that the government can credibly do that and the banking system isn't too large, or if conversely actually the banking system is really large and the, and the size amount of credit is so large, then it may well be that actually the zombie approach is the best you can do, as you could maybe make the argument in 1990s Japan. If, if taking the necessary degree of write-downs is so large that it just creates still other bankruptcies, especially if, yes, as you say, everyone is marking to market, then maybe it is best to kind of sweep it under the carpet. But then don't expect that you're going to be able to get back uh, and don't put pressure on your central bank to try to get back to um, bubble-like periods of growth. Uh, during this period where, again, you're still uh, healing very gradually. I, I think there's an argument in both directions, but I feel like we haven't had the intellectual honesty to, 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 to address it properly. Now, there is a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison, Charles, in what you just said. Now, if you think about 1992, it was much more of an exogenous shock, and then it's just exactly what the engineers do. Well, it's an optimal control exercise, you know exactly how much money comes in, how much money comes out, and then you can figure out how profitable you are in a relatively well-performing economy until those loans have disappeared. Right? So it's an exogenous shock. The zombie problem is not a UK problem. The zombie problem is banks like Bankia and most of Spain, a lot of Italy, a lot of Greece, etc., is banks that are not hit by an exogenous shock but by excessive borrowing before the crisis and have been walking dead at least for the past five or six years. Those banks... Those zombie banks would be better off being put to death. But there well, is no zombie well, problem. Well, well, it's well, not well, in the UK. Well, 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 well. And hold on, hold on a bit. And what you get is you get your foreclosures. Uh, you then get widows jumping out of houses because they can't <laughs> pay. And what then happens is the political effect of that is for the government in effect, to say that no bank can evict anyone under any circumstance. And then you're going to be jolly lucky that anybody repays their mortgage interest. And you've got to, th- you've got to think these things through. And this, and, is less th- the, but, and this is more or less the situation that Spain is in, t- in today. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, 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 it makes it worse, not better. To, to kill the Fasoli banks. Uh, what about the Japanese? They have a very nice, nice experience with zombie banks. They have kept their society together. The unemployment rate has remained very low. Socially, they've um, and as a as a nation, they've remained in much better shape. I'd much rather live in Japan than live in Spain or Greece. <laughs> and, and yet they were probably only able to do that because there wasn't the same question about the level of sovereign debt and the ability to finance themselves as we and then have in Japan's the got much more sovereign debt than either Italy or Greece they, they haven't got as much foreign owned sovereign debt but they've got much more sovereign debt altogether. but again through, through this period again they were able to sweep those problems under, under the carpet uh, in part because it's only now that people are starting to fret about their sovereign debt levels. If Spain we, we tries to do the same thing... Maybe we ought to be building bigger carpets so we can sweep more <laughs> under it. <laughs> Let's go to the audience now. All right, so uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, collect questions in groups of three. And, and, and please keep your questions uh, short uh, if you can. Um, we have roving microphones as well. And so I see uh, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Martin. Um, to what extent do the panel think that the financial crisis of 2007-08 was, uh, was caused not by a failure of regulation but a failure of monetary policy? Okay. So that's question one. Let's collect... Um, let's see. This gentleman over here. Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, Yemi Johnson. My question is this. Given that we can't really predict completely and truly the unintended consequences of financial regulation before the crisis occurs, maybe shouldn't we then focus more <laughs> on ensuring that the intended consequences of financial regulation are actually achieved? Maybe that might be a better way of looking at the problem. Thanks. Okay. Yes. And then uh, one more question to collect. 
Yes, the lady in the back. Um, my question is about the, um, the financial regulations that are not harmonized globally. So, uh, for instance, Basel is not adopted by most U.S. banks, um, and uh, the bonus rules are not uniform uh, across uh, uh, the United States and EU. And uh, also prop trading, um, the approach to prop trading is not uniform. So my question is, what do you think is the biggest deal in, among these unharmonized areas? And how do you feel that this is going to affect the way banking is done and the financial markets move? Great. Thank you. So, panel? I think the first has to be for Charles. With failure of monetary policy. Uh, I don't think it had much to do with the failure of monetary policy. I think it had a lot to do with the, uh, the failure to um, realize the, the need for finance. I, there, was a, there was a myth that if you maintained uh, price stability and if all the banks observed Basel II, uh, then nothing wrong could go. Nothing could go wrong, and that was just mistaken. Uh, it was a failure to to understand the sort of the Minsky point that uh, price stability did not entail financial stability, um, and a failure to appreciate uh, actually how fragile the banking system was. And the, and to my mind, the sort of the the epitome of it was when. Um, I think it was Bernanke I hope I'm not being unfair to him I think it was Bernanke who argued uh, in about August September 2007 that subprime really couldn't be the cause of a serious financial crisis because never had bank profits been higher and never had banks capital been stronger than they were in the summer of 2007 um, and this was partly caused by uh, the, the treatment of uh, or, or the, the utilization and the, the, the misinterpretation of mark to market uh, determined uh, figures for bank profitability and bank capital. Now, it wasn't just the failure of, of, the, of the regulators and the failure of the academics. It was a failure of the market as well. I never, ever have CDS sort of premium been lower? Did, it, did the market think that the, that the banking system was stronger than in the summer of 2007, just at a time when the whole thing was so fragile um, that it, 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 it blew? It was a failure of ideas. It was a failure of intellectual conceptualization at the highest level, and it was common everywhere. It was common to bankers, it was common to regulators, it was common to, um, and to many academics. And the number of people who didn't suffer from it were very few. Now, perhaps, when I think about the failures of monetary policy, I'd probably identify at least two in my mind immediately. The first is the, uh, is the Greenspan put, was the idea that you could use monetary policy to rectify any pending shock to the economy and therefore uh, by itself it creates moral hazard and that created the condition, it created the uh, apparent stability that then led to the excesses in the system. So trying to use monetary policy, believing in its power, in excessive power, was one contributory factor. The second is more remote but is relates to the problem of monetary policy became the only objective of some central banks at the expense of financial stability. Historically, if you, if you look at the Bank of England 100 years ago, Bank of England had two objectives, financial stability and monetary policy. Before 2007, the prevailing view was that all central banks did was monetary policy at the neglect of financial stability. And that, so that, 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 that's more indirect, but that's one, neg that's one contributory factor of monetary policy to the crisis. Any comments? Uh, would anyone like to take we, up the other there's questions? A, there's a, there's a, with the, the, the harmonization. Right. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to find out uh, because we're going down the vicar's route of, of ring fencing and division into two parts. Um, and the continentals are not. 
and the French and Germans are not going to go touch, are not going near that they're not going to touch it so that there's going to be a very considerable division between the uh, treatment of the banking systems in the UK and the treatment of the banking systems in the rest of the EU uh, and so we'll soon find out uh, what the effect of a lack of harmonization uh, in the some of the major structural elements of our banking systems will turn out to be. Now, when, when you think about harmonization, uh, the, the question made the assertion, I think, that the problem arises perhaps because the U.S. has been <coughs> late in implementing Basel III and, and Europe perhaps faster. I, th- I don't think that is the problem, really. Uh, that's, that's not the biggest problem. Because the U.S. and Europe and Japan and Korea are all separate banking markets, the problem, right, is, problem is much bigger in Europe because here in Europe we have a common market for financial services, meaning a bank in the UK can operate all through the union, but in spite of Basel III, in spite of the union, the rules are quite different. Uh, the same bank, the, if, if you take bank capital calculations in one member country, you might find that bank capital is 78 and then you go to another country, it might be 12.5, as recent studies have indicated. So within Europe, Euro- European regulators are interpreting the European rules in a very different way, and some countries are, are, have, take, take a very different approach to what is maximum, what is minimum capital, uh, what is ring fencing of countries, not of financial institutions. At the same time, we have a common market in financial services in Europe. To me, that's a much bigger harmonization problem, that Europe cannot get its act together and treat Europe as a single... If Europe wants to treat Europe as a single market for financial services, it also has to treat it as a single market in terms of financial regulation, which it seems to be unable to do. Of the the specific factors you mentioned, I would probably pick on the risk weights. And yet, for me, it's it's less to do with the risk weights differences themselves, and it's it's what that says about the complete lack of transparency that you still get. Um, And the the fact that... uh, any time a bank fails, or almost any time a bank fails, whether it's Lehman, whether it's SNS Real in the, in the Netherlands, their capital ratios always look fantastic the day before. Yeah. And somehow, kind of across the board, we're requesting more and more data, sometimes in a consistent fashion, sometimes in an inconsistent fashion, and yet you less, get left with feeling like you still haven't got any of the crucial information. And so for me, it, it's, it's those differences in one way or another, whether it's the risk weights themselves or, or somehow the application of the rules. Just as a financial analyst, you're left sitting there saying, I'm none the miser, I have no idea what's in this thing. And and that in turn leads to to mistrust the moment that problems start appearing. That's because you're looking at accounting data. If you look (laughs) at accounting data, you're you're going to be a year or two out of date, and it's going to be manipulated anyhow. um, (laughs) There was a splendid study by the the International Monetary Fund did, um, comparing the uh, accounting data uh, of tier one capital, the banks that failed with the banks that survived. The banks that failed had a higher tier one capital accounting data uh, than the banks that survived. I mean, the, the accounting data are, are almost entirely useless as a guide to well, virtually anything you might like to want to know about a bank. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Shall we collect another group of three? Malcolm? Um, you've all talked about um, these macro uh, financial issues, but I think only John Danielson actually mentioned macro prudential regulation and only en passant. Uh, it's easy to be cynical about macro prudential regulation, but isn't it a fact that if the authorities the, the macroprudential regulators collected and properly parsed data on evolving risk concentrations and published some aggregative data on that, that the externalities of systemic risk could be internalized through market pricing. And some of these problems that we consider regulatory problems might be um, at least t- to some es- extent alleviated by changes in market pricing. I wonder if you could comment on how effective that could be in strengthening financial stability going forward. 
Yes, uh, right behind. I don't have a question, actually. I have a comment. I'm uh, sort of appalled by uh, Charles's uh, views on, uh, on bail-ins. What he proposes, letting the taxpayer cough up, is inefficient, unfair, it undermines the legitimacy of financial capitalism, and it's unnecessary. Creditors are there to be bailed in when the entity that they've lent to goes bust. That's what God made them for. That's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, there's absolutely no problem, of course, technical or other, with bailing in those who can't run, the holders of bonds, and indeed of all deposits except deposit withdrawal on demand. Term deposits, certificates of deposit, they can all be bailed in um, effortlessly. Um, no, those who cannot run, you can bail in ex ante through COCOs, but ex post, of course, all debt is COCOs, right? And uh, once uh, and you need a special resolution regime that can overnight right, uh, send uh, congratulatory messages to bondholders saying, you are now shareholders, right? <laughs> and, and that would take care of it. And um, uh, um, so deposits uh, are a, a bit of a problem if the demand deposit because of withdrawal on demand, but we should only insure those and require and say, uh, declare all deposits that, uh, uh, that are not insured to be not withdrawable on demand. I think that's a very simple solution uh, to that issue. Finally, the, um, uh, sure, this will raise the f uh, bailing in bondholders and indeed depositors will raise the cost of funding. In the case of depositors, it may cause runs, but this is uh, what God made the land of last resort for. You don't need belt and braces for systemic stability. One is enough. Um, but um, uh, it should raise the cost of funding because banks are subsidized and have excessive leverage. The banking sector is too large. We need to shrink the balance sheets. And what you implicitly do by making it look so awful is that you look at secondary market discounts on existing debt, uh, bank debt, held by banks that are bust and excessively leveraged, right? but that tells us nothing about what the cost of new bank debt issuance would be once the banks have been recapitalized and deleveraged mm -hmm. by bailing in the existing old debt, right? So um, contagion <coughs> risk really is the last excuse of the scoundrel. I must say. <laughs> Let's get one more quick question. The gentleman uh, top right there. Yes. Is systemic risk ex exacerbated by concentration in the UK banking sector? And if so, what solutions would you propose? Okay, great. We have a trio of questions here. Panel. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be told by Willem uh, what God has intended for the bank <laughs> portfolios. Exactly, the sky's I'm, opened. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, I. I I'd be much happier going down your line if there was a much, much higher holding of equity so that the actual loss given default uh, of the bondholders that you want to bail in or the depositors you want to uh, prevent from running uh, would be likely to suffer much less. I think that the problem has been that the equity is far too low along the lines that Matt here and, um, uh, and Helwig have said, suggested. And the, the difficulty is largely that um, I, although everyone, or at least most every economist that I know, agrees that the system would be far safer and far better with a much, much higher equity ratio, the difficulty is how to get there. Because given the incentives uh, that shareholders and most bank managers are very large shareholders are, not to dilute their own position, and particularly in market conditions that we have at present, there is no way that uh, bankers and their shareholders are going to happily uh, have very large new issues of equity. So if you just say you've got to have a much higher equity ratio, all you will get is deleveraging. So what we need to worry about much more is the process the dynamic process for getting banks uh, to have a very much higher equity ratio. And if we could get an appropriate, much, much higher equity ratio with a leverage 
a ratio that isn't as the the, tier, the Treasury Select Committee suggested, moving up from uh, 33 to 1 to 25 to 1, that is moved to something like maybe uh, 10 to 1 or 7 to 1. Yeah. Under those circumstances, I'd be prepared to go much more in your direction and say that we got to the stage where uh, the equity, much larger equity, was completely wiped out then we could turn to the other creditors. But at the moment, um, with the likelihood that the governments, for the kind of reasons that you and I both know perfectly well, are not going to uh, hit the depositors, even the uninsured depositors, the likely loss given default um, on the bondholders will be so great that the it will be just considered so risky to be a bondholder under these circumstances, you won't get any new financing. And although the existing guys may be stuck, these bonds are not usually issued at enormously long maturities or duration. So any bank that's going to finance itself has got to roll over these things, as you know, uh, fairly frequently. And the, you know, you're just not going to get your rollovers. You're not going to get the financing through this kind of route. Now, if I take Malcolm's question, I think that, if I understand you correctly, and we should probably discuss it in more detail later, my answer is no. And, like I said, maybe I just, maybe I misunderstand the question, but, 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 but you're talking about if banks collect data and publish, uh, sort of if, if banks, if, if, if you, if you, have posi- if you have a sample positions, you publish consistent risk estimates of sample positions across banks, that will, that will provide more information. This is a proposal that's been, that's been floated by a few people. I think it's, banks will just publish what the banks want to publish without it necessarily having any connections to what's going on within, within the banks. They are not going to use – they might you, – you might get a consistent measurement of risk for those sample portfolios, right? That does not mean the banks use those models for risk assessments internally. This is, this, is a, this is yet a different issue. And those portfolios might not be representative of the bank anyways. So it's going to give a measure of, of, of risk with, with, within the bank that has, might be very little, little to do with what is actually going on. However, that said, you could imagine it, it, it's a relatively complicated issue. On the, on the last question, which was about does the fact that a few banks in the UK mean more systemic risk? Not necessarily. And take Germany being sort of the opposite example. Germany has 1,000-plus banks. Does the fact Germany has 1,000-plus banks make it more diversified and therefore having more systemic risk? Probably not, because a lot of these banks, they behave very harmoniously in a very similar way. What matters from the point of view of systemic risk does Barclays behave in the same way as HSBC, or do they behave differently? When a shock comes, does Barclays sell and HSBC buy, even in the shock, or do they both buy or both sell at the same time? And the heterogeneity among banks determines systemic risk, not in number. In Germany, with a lot more banks, banks are quite harmonious the, because of the particular system they have, and one could even, even argue that they have less actual diversification and more harmonious behavior, and therefore more potential for systemic risk than in the UK. I can chip in on, on, on that particular issue. Yes, I'm with you on heterogeneity, but I'd also say it's the total size. I, I'm less worried about the concentration necessarily. I think, that, again, we've had too much focus on regulation of individual banks and not enough on the, on the very systemic risk which remain out there, mostly the, the almost universal holdings of sovereign debt. So I'm, I'm less fussed on the, the concentration than on the, the total size of the banking sector in different, different countries, and I think that's one of the big problems that Europe has relative to the U.S., on the uh, idea of pub- um, uh, macroprudential data and, and publishing it. Again, I would say, for me, the, the yes, this is a really good idea, and yet a lot of the importance is at a macro level, not for the individual banks. And, and the irony here, though, is that, that this is not nearly sufficient. Often data on you know, bubble in housing market or bubble in sovereign debt market and uh, the sheer size of credit in the system is f- fully and freely available already. The key questions are, A, uh, recognizing it as a bubble and having the guts then to do something about it through macroprudential re- regulation or monetary policy or whatever, and then B, when that causes losses in the system, having the mechanism to deal with it, and hence all of this discussion around, around bail-in. And for me, that's, that's probably more important than the publishing per se, but yes, it's a step in the right direction. 
Uh, and then just lastly on that, on that bail-in point to pick up from, from Charles and the, the, the banks not getting funding, um, I used to worry a great deal about that, and I still worry about it a little bit, but I have been staggered in the case of Cocos and the obvious example recently of being the Barclays Cocos, the 9% Cocos that, uh, don't, that are basically riskier than equity, how short the market's memory has been, and I don't see why that shouldn't be the case in future. Again, it's, it's staggering what the need for yield will do to people. And so while, yes, you'd have this initial period of, oh, my goodness, everything is getting bailed in, uh, I suspect that actually before long people will be forced back to uh, buy the very same securities that are giving them losses. And that gives you kind of a, a nasty cuspiness as stuff get, uh, gets bailed in. But I'm not sure it needs, leads to permanent exclusion from the market in the way in which you say it. And I don't take much comfort from the idea that we all have terribly short memories. That's it. That seems to me the basic reason why we've had at least three property bubbles and busts in this country. And we're going to have another one. And, you know, it's because there are short memories that we get this. And we short memories and we extrapolate the recent past. So we um, need them more often and then we don't forget. <laughs> but preferably small. Well, we sort of... We, we have a, some kind of sacrificial scapegoat who um, is... Uh, is is forced into bankruptcy sort of every two years. Yes. And cho- 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 chosen at random. Or... Y- y- yes, because, because that avoids the build-up of risk to uncontrollable levels because people are reminded of it rather than being lulled into a false sense of security which permits still more credit. Could ask to <laughs> Any more comments on those questions? Right. Let's have one more group of quick questions. We're almost running out of time, and I want to uh, allow the panel members uh, to make some closing remarks. So we have a gentleman in the front. You were first. The white hair gentleman. Yes, he's been, been, since been, the beginning he's been asking for a long time. Right there, okay. And, and, and that gentleman, you're number two. A, a very short question. To what extent do, or to, yeah, to what extent are we actually looking at a failure of risk-based regulation rather than a failure of regulation? All right. And then the gentleman there. Yes. Uh, I'm Donald Alexander. Very interesting to see you uh, enlisted the help of mathematical organi- um, societies. Um, that's I understand. I don't know if you're... Uh, <coughs> You're talking about system, systematic views. Have you modeled the system? Uh, the notes would be banks or anybody else involved. And the, and the interconnections could be money flows. They could be um, contagion. <clears throat> but the mathematical thing is that the more interconnections there are, the more dangerous the system becomes. And would the corollary from that be that someone has to be looking at the overall system? Mm-hmm. Should we have one more? Ask the gentleman there. On the closing note of unintended consequences, uh, should we all be showered with a few shares of RBS and will that make it all better again? Okay, great. Thank you for those. Uh, panel? Now, just to, take, to, do, to do this quickly, we are, so we are talking both about the, it was about the failure of risk-based regulation or failure of regulation. Of course, we talk about both. Regulation did fail before the crisis, but uh, it's, it's a complex question. But the biggest failure is the failure of risk-based, risk-based regulation because there is a view somehow, I think it's because of the engineers, that you can actually go out, you can measure the financial system as an engineering system, you can properly measure systemic risk, you, you create... A, a, a risk measurement device, plug it into the bowels of the city of London, and out pops risk is 3.562. If you want one more digit, spend more money on it. I think that is exactly the wrong attitude. You cannot properly measure risk. You do it only on the trading floor, maybe you can, you can use risk models to control the behavior of traders. But for a macro potential policy, I think risk models have all risk based regulation is, has no real purpose. After the gentleman's question, last question, this actually is a very active research agenda on networks. In the center, we have this. This is one of the planks of the center. It's on our website, so the, we have four planks in the, with our research agenda. Networks is one plank. What people are looking at within this is, for example, exposure data. 
So you have, uh, you know, all the flows flo uh, flowing from one institution to another. The Bank of England and the FSA, they know the identities of these people, and that has been used to very precisely map out the financial system, and we are collaborating in that work. So this is a very active agenda, both here in our centre and throughout the world. Any more comments? When I, on, on interconnections, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. And I, we live in a world that is inevitably increasingly interconnected in every respect. It's not just banking, it's in all ways. Uh, and think of the, the problems of uh, what would happen if, our, if there was some kind of cyber attack on our societies. Um, I, and what's more, it's not always the direct interconnections, it's the indirect interconnections. There were a lot of studies that were done, because there were quite good data on interbank borrowing and lending. And there were a lot of studies done on what would happen if Bank X went down um, and couldn't repay the bank from whom it had borrowed. And most of those studies actually showed that the direct connections between banks of that kind were not enormously damaging. What was much more damaging was the indirect effect through the actions of banks uh, who got themselves under, into difficulties or trying to get themselves out of difficulties um, by selling assets for which the market wasn't broad enough. Um, and the sale of assets to try and restore your liquidity position and get out of being excessively exposed uh, from a microprudential point of view, appeared to be very sensible. But from a macroprudential point of view, the sale by one bank weakened the position of all the other banks. So it was the, it was the indirect connections as much as the direct connections um, that was um, and particularly the case. And on risk-based regulation, um, and I think that the, um, and the idea that you could measure risk uh, in a clear and what's more a, a, a constant way so that you knew what the appropriate risk weightings were at all times as events changed I mean, it was a, uh, again it was a completely mistaken concept uh, and it was it was, a, it was a failure to perceive that the value at risk measurements which had their uses which were very considerable in the ordinary management of day-to-day -day banking business, was totally inappropriate if you were looking at a, what the regulators needed to look at. Matt, any comments? All right, so we have just a little amount of time remaining. I'll ask the panel members to make very short concluding remarks, maybe a sentence or two, on the takeaways from tonight. Now, I guess if you do the reverse order, I have an existential fear so thinking about this. We live in a world where the regulators is increasingly telling the banks not only how to measure risk, but in this country probably how to take risk. We live in a world where the taxpayers underwrite now increasing amount of losses, and we get very elegant advocacy of that here. <laughs> Aren't we... Moving into a world, isn't the next, and then we, compensation is regulated, isn't the next step that the politicians will start demanding nationalization of the banking system, moving the whole thing into state control? That's sort of, I think, what the trend is, and that's a very dangerous trend. So, that, so that's my exist existential worry from this discussion. Matt? The risk that's out there can be suppressed, but it can't be eliminated. And it's not losses that come from risks themselves which are particularly bad. What creates the lasting problems, the hangover, is when there is debt associated with it and people are struggling to repay the debt. And it's because of this that the crisis has been getting bigger. There was relatively little debt associated with the dot-com boom. There was a lot more associated with real estate. And there's going to be an awful lot more still uh, as we deal with the sovereigns. As a result, what you need are mechanisms for controlling the amount of credit growth in the first place and for distributing losses when they occur. And yes, as you get that, you're probably going to get slower growth and more frequent losses, but that may well not be a bad thing. Charles? Uh, well, my takeaway is that we all know much too little uh, about what is likely to cause serious difficulties but the serious difficulties in the financial system are likely to recur. 
And that gives a very important reason why a center dealing with systemic risk with some extremely good people in it is uh, a highly desirable thing to occur. And I'm delighted that younger people than I am are going to be taking it forward. Excellent. Younger and better people than I <laughs> will be taking it forward. Well, this concludes the first of many successful events of the new Systemic Risk Center. I want to thank the panel members for uh, coming tonight and providing very interesting uh, and thought-provoking material. I want to thank you for coming as well on this wintry evening. Thank you.